All right, I will start the introduction while we're waiting for more folks to join in. But my name is Danielle Paget, and I'm the chair this year for the FSHP ER and Critical Care Forum. We're very excited to have this CE presentation for you tonight, and we're happy that you joined um, despite the pending hurricane. We hope that if you are in the line of the hurricane's path, that you and your family will be safe. Um, and we appreciate you taking the time um, to join into this educational opportunity. Um, I'm gonna put my email in the chat. If you are interested in getting more involved within our forum, we have once monthly meetings. Um, we put on events such as this um, and we are open to finding other topics and other speakers for an event that's coming up um, later in this year. So if you have any questions about the forum um, or need any more information, I'll put my email there for you and I'll pass it over to Corinne so we can get started. Thanks again for joining. Awesome. Thank you, Danielle. And I echo her comments. Um, I really encourage any of you who are practicing or interested in critical care or EM to join the forum. Um, it's such a great group of people. And every month we're sharing hot topics um, with topics like this and other topics. And um, I also echo her comments. So thank you for joining us during a uh, pending hurricane and um, at least in South Florida, not nice weather. Um, today, we're going to be doing a TEG talk, decoding viscoelastic testing in critical care. Um, we have for you uh, myself. So uh, I'll be the moderator and one of the speakers for today. I'm Corinne Berger. I'm an assistant professor of pharmacy practice at Nova Southeastern University and also a critical care pharmacist at Broward Health Medical Center practicing in the medical and trauma ICUs. I am joined by Dr. Bradley Rogers, who is an EM specialist at Memorial Regional Hospital, Bibi Subedi, who is a MICU specialist at Advent Health Orlando, and George Urias, who is also a MICU specialist at UF Health Shands Hospital. And our goal for today is to talk about viscoelastic testing. First of all, what is it? Uh, and how is it different from our traditional coagulation testing? And also to evaluate viscoelastic testing in some special patient populations, and then finally to interpret results and be able to apply them to real world cases. So as we talk about this, you know, we're all really familiar with our conventional coagulation tests, right? INR, PT, PTT, CBC, so things like H&H, &H, platelets, um, and even fibrinogen and D-dimer. On the flip side, right, we have viscoelastic testing, and that's just a broad umbrella term for our two proprietary brands, and those include thromboelastography, or TEG, and rotational thromboelastometry, or ROTAM. So sometimes we'll use those words interchangeably. It all relates to viscoelastic testing. So unlike our conventional coagulation tests, we're really taking like centrifuged plasma and getting this, you know, numeric quantitative value that's kind of in silo, our viscoelastic testing is going to take whole blood and really tell us about how not only the factors, but how they're interacting with platelets and red blood cells and making a clot. And we're going to go into that in much more detail. So the pros and cons, right? So we're very familiar with things like PT, INR, and we do get a numerical value. And so we get some quantitative data but it's not functional. So for example, if I get a platelet count that's 300, that just tells me that you have 300 platelets, but I don't know if you're on antiplatelets, if those platelets are working properly. So it doesn't give us the full information that we need to really assess coagulopathy. But on the flip side, we see these numbers all the time. We're very comfortable reading and interpreting INR, uh, CBCs, et cetera. They're pretty cheap for the most part. Uh, and I say variable turnaround time, so usually we can get them pretty quick, but by the time you're drawing the labs, uh, sending them to the labs, you know, it could be like an hour or so. Viscoelastic testing, on the other hand, right, now we're getting quantitative data, so we do get a numerical value, but we're also getting functional information. So how do all of these components interact with each other to truly form a clot? It is a point of care test, meaning uh, we can have these machines at the bedside and be able to interpret them rapidly. Now, not every place has it as a point of care test. So it's possible your machine is still in the lab. And so you're having someone walk over or possibly tube over the data to the lab. And then depending on where the test is displayed, um, maybe you can see it from the lab, maybe they're printing a report and sending it, maybe they're putting it in your EMR, or maybe you have a screen where you see it in real time. So it has the ability of being a point of care test if you use it that way. 
Certainly it's more expensive. Um, and like I mentioned, there is this need for EMR integration. So unlike INR, PTT, et cetera, where you know, those tests result in the lab and then pretty much are available in Cerner or Epic or your EMR, there's a lot of variability to um, the viscoelastic testing. <clears throat> and then, of course, we need training and calibration. So depending on which model you have, there may be quite a bit of calibration. And all of us are here today to, you know, get some training and to learn about, you know, how do we use and interpret these tests correctly? So, you know, kind of going back a step, what exactly is this? And so viscoelastic testing refers to a point of care test that's measuring hemostasis in a whole blood. So again, unlike some of our conventional tests, which are just kind of measuring it in plasma, now we're looking at whole blood. So all of the blood components, and it's going to measure the viscosity of the blood clot. And so this is referring to our older models. Brad is actually going to take us through some of the newer models like TEG success. But the general concept is you put a sample of whole blood in a cup. So you collect it, you put it in a cup, and either the cup will oscillate as in with TEG or the pin will oscillate as in with Rotom. But basically what's going to happen is that oscillation is going to drive formation of a clot. And as the clot starts forming, there's going to be resistance on the pin, and that resistance is going to be displayed and converted through a transducer into a numerical value and into a graph. So that's kind of like, you know, the very simplified version of that, at least in the old models. The new models are a little bit newer. <laughs> like I said, Bradley's going to talk about that and tell us about some of the benefits. Now, what can we get from viscoelastic testing? You know, why go through this hassle? First of all, we are getting a picture of what the clot actually looks like. We don't really have any other tests. You know, we can get a PTT, but that doesn't, that's not telling me how you're clotting or what it looks like. Here, I can actually get a visual assessment of what the clot looks like as it's forming in real time and clot breakdown or lysis in real time. It's gonna give us both a qualitative and quantitative assessment of coagulopathy, including all of the phases of clot formation or coagulation. So initiation, formation, and breakdown. And then you're going to get this computer tracing. So I have for you the picture that you get, as well as the numerical values. And so I included TEG and Rotom. Uh, we use those terms interchangeably. They're two different proprietary systems. And so the normal values are not really interchangeable because they're using different reagents. And so you do really need to look at uh, which device you're using and correlate the values that way. But what they are measuring is very similar. And so you can see here, uh, and we'll go over this more in depth, this is giving you our time for TEG, but then the equivalent is clotting time for Rotom and so on and so forth. Now, even though this is really new for us, a lot of us you know, haven't had a lot of experience, this technology has been around for decades. So TEG was first developed in 1948 and used later on, uh, its first clinical application was really in the Vietnam War. Then we got more experience in liver patients, particularly for liver transplant patients, cardiac surgery trauma. And then in 2006, we had um, Rotom was made available. And you can see, right, just from the picture on the left, <laughs> it used to be a machine that took up a whole wall. And now the TEG 6S, which is kind of a newer version of TEG, is pretty small and compact and can kind of go anywhere, making it kind of truly a point of care test. These are the most common devices. So you have our older models, the TEG 5000, the Rotom Delta, and then sort of our newer models, the TEG 6S and the, the, uh, the Rotom Sigma. I did wanna just give an example. So at Broward Health, we now have um, the 6S, but this is an example of a few months ago when we had the TEG 5000. So at the bedside, the nurse will collect whole blood in a citrated blue top tube, right? So it's citrated so that it's gonna bind calcium. So the clot's not gonna form in the tube. Then it goes to the lab, at least at our institution, that's what we would do. And in the lab, they would mix it with a kaolin activator. So that's now gonna activate clot formation so that you're not waiting around hours so that it speeds up the process and we can get the data faster. That then is going to be manually pipetted into these little cups and then the cup, like we talked about, is going to go in the machine. It's hard to see, but there's this little pin on top here, and then the cup goes in. And like I said, because this is TEG, the cup is going to oscillate. 
And at Broward, we had this monitor in our trauma bay and the results will show on the monitor um, in real time. So again, a point of care test, but we were walking it to the lab, the lab was running it, and then we could only see it in the trauma bay, right? Since then, now we have the tech success. It's a much different process. You don't have to use these cups and pipetting, which is a lot nicer for us. Um, and we also have tech manager. So it's an electronic system where I can log in and see the results anywhere. Before with the system we had, you know, I had to really be in the trauma bay in order to see what the results were as they were happening. If I was in the ICU waiting for the patient, I would have to, you know, wait for word of mouth or wait for the results to be put into Cerner. Now I can log in and see it anywhere. So uh, it is kind of important to know what your institution does so you know how to utilize the results and access them. The next part, we're kind of going to go step by step and see like, okay, what are the different parameters and how do we use them and interpret them and think about what treatments we would potentially give based on abnormal parameters. So on the top, I try to include both TEG and Rotom. <clears throat> Again, they're not interchangeable, but they do sort of both measure um, similar things. So for TEG, we're talking about the R time. For Rotom, we're talking about the clotting time or CT. Both of these are gonna tell us from time zero, how long does it take to reach this amplitude of two millimeters? Basically, how long does it take for the clot to start forming? And that's really going to tell us, like, how is your coagulation cascade and thrombin generation working? And that is a function of factors. So if there is an issue with the R time or clotting time, that is suggestive of a factor deficiency. So then when we think of treatment, you know, what would we what would we give for prolonged R time? It's things that have factors in them. So plasma potentially or prothrombin complex concentrates. Now, there starts to be fancier testing we can do. So we know that we can give patients heparin and that's going to prolong their R time. Now you can actually run a specific test. So in Rotom it's called a heptem. Um, and in TEG, it's called a heparinase TEG, where basically I'm giving heparinase. So I'm removing the heparin component and I'm basically running the test again. And if I do that and the R time normalizes, so now the graph looks normal, well, now I know, well, it's heparin that caused the issue because without the heparin, the issue is resolved. So maybe that's suggestive that it's not a factor deficiency, but maybe I need to give a heparin reversal like pertamine, or maybe I just need to wait if the patient's not having a major bleed. The next parameters we have look more at clot propagation. So uh, this I would say is the trickiest and has the fuzziest data, but for TEG, we say kinetics. For Rotom, we say clot formation time, and both of them use the term alpha angle. And that's really just the time for when you started making the clot to when you reach this amplitude of 20 millimeters. So how long does it take to actually get the clot to um, start growing and, to, and the speed of clot propagation? And so what contributes to that is fibrin activation. And so we think that maybe deficiencies here or abnormalities here may be a sign of hypofibrinogenemia. <laughs> so the treatment, if your K time is prolonged and your alpha angle is decreased, maybe it would be just replacing fire. Uh, fibrin, either with cryo or fibrinogen concentrate. I will say this is a little tricky because there's a lot more that goes into it. So unlike the R time that I think is more straightforward, there are more things that can influence the kinetics of um, the kinetics parameter. The max amplitude. So for TEG, we say max amplitude. And for Rotom, we say max clot formation. Those are both measuring the same thing. So if you look at this red box, it's really how big does your clot get? What is the top line to the bottom line? And that is really going to be um, telling us the contribution of fibrinogen and platelets. A lot of people like to quote the ratio that, you know, it's more platelets. So probably it's like 80% platelets and 20% fibrinogen. I don't know if those percentages are exactly right, but there is going to be a stronger platelet contribution, but both of those contribute. So if you have your abnormalities in your max amplitude, let's say it's reduced, so it's smaller than what would be normal, that suggests that you have maybe a lack of platelets or platelet dysfunction or hypofibrinogenemia. Now, just like our time, right, um, we have some fancy tests that we can do to tease this out a little bit further. 
So if you're just looking at the MA, that max amplitude or the MCT, MCF, max clot formation, and it's decreased, you can say, well, we can give platelets plus or maybe, uh, plus or minus maybe cryo. But there are additional tests we can do to tease out, well, is it really platelets or is it the fibrinogen? So on the newer TEG models, the TEG 6S, we have something called a functional fibrinogen. Basically what that does is add ipsiximab or a platelet inhibitor to the sample. So it removes the platelet component completely. And it's just telling us this is, this is the contribution of fibrinogen. So if I remove the platelet part and the fibrinogen looks normal, that's telling me, well, probably then platelets is the issue. And it's, again, there's an analogous test on the Rotom. You can run a FibTem. That's going to tell you about the fibrinogen as well. If you don't have the fancy neuromachines, machines, uh, what we used to use was like a low alpha angle. So basically using that to suggest, well, if you have a low alpha angle, you can't make the clot fast enough. That's a function of fibrinogen. So maybe you need cryo. But that is that data is a little bit tougher to interpret. And then finally, we have lysis. So fibrinolysis is measured either by LY30 on TEG or LI30 on Rotom. They're measuring the same thing, but they're just opposite ways of doing it. So LY30 is the percent reduction after 30 minutes, and the LI30 is the percent remaining. So basically, if you have an issue here, that's saying, well, maybe you're breaking the clot down too fast. You have accelerated fibrinolysis. And so the treatment here, if it's increased LY30 or decreased LI30, maybe is an antifibrinolytic, like tranexamic acid or aminocuproic acid. And then, you know, basically putting it all together, you get this graph. And as you get more and more familiarity with looking at TEG and Rotom and seeing these graphs, you might not even need the numbers, right? If you, if you see this super long line, we call it like the stem of a wine glass, um, and that's your R time, and it's going past 10 or so minutes, I, I might not even need a number. I'm like, oh, this is a problem, right? Like I, I haven't even started making a clot. I need to get factors. Um, putting it all together, right? So the clot initiation, that's really going to be the R time or the clotting time. The kinetics that we talked about and the alpha angle and the max amplitude, that's going to tell us about the strength of the clot. And then finally, the LY30 or LI30, that's going to tell us about clot breakdown. So hopefully this helps demonstrate that unlike a PTT or INR that's just giving us, you know, kind of in silo one numeric value, using viscoelastic testing is telling us a lot of information about what's happening to the patient and how the patient is making and breaking down clots. And then no need to memorize all this, but again, this is just showing you that we then can take that data and translate it into treatment options. And so, you know, I have these all here, but I think probably the most common uh, values that we use would be a prolonged R time telling us that we need factors, either via FFP or PCC, a decreased max amplitude, so that clot strength, telling us that we need either platelets or cryo. Again, we can do that fancier testing to uh, tease out whether it's really a fibrinogen issue or a platelet issue. And then finally, the LY30 or the LI30 telling us if we need an antifibrinolytic. So I have a few quick cases to run through. So having no data, but just seeing the numbers and running through them quickly. Um, the first case, <laughs> you can see the patient values in the middle and then our normal reference ranges to the right. So which parameter here is abnormal? You can see that our time is prolonged. And so like we talked about, that would potentially be a factor deficiency issue where we would give factors. Case two, now we have the max amplitude is decreased. So this is telling us probably it's a platelet, platelet issue and we give platelets. Again, we have that fancy testing. So if your um, MCF, which is like the Rotom equivalent of the MA is low, we can check the FibTem. And again, the FibTem, that's going to take out the platelet component and tell us is it a fibrinogen issue? So I give cryo. Or is the fifth time normal? And then maybe I just need to give platelets because it's a platelet issue. And then our last case, um, just for kind of general case information, 
Here now we have a few abnormalities. So in this case, we don't have the fancy TEG success. We have the TEG 5000. So we're still relying on K time and alpha angle. We have a prolonged K time, a reduced alpha angle, and a reduced MA. So we know it's either a fibrinogen or a platelet function issue. And so maybe we'll give cryoprecipitate and platelets. Again, if we had that TEG success, I could take the platelet component out completely check the functional fibrinogen, see how is the functional fibrinogen, and use that to determine if I need to give cryo or platelets. If you don't have that, the MA is still helpful. Maybe you just give platelets or maybe you give platelets plus cryo. It still helps tell you, well, I don't need plasma in this particular case. So hopefully you guys have seen, there's a lot of limitations. It's a really cool test, but you really need a lot of training. We're not as familiar with reading and interpreting these results the way we are with COAGs. We don't always have the results right away. There's such a wide range of normal values. So if you're on the border, what does that mean? Abnormal values do not always correlate with bleeding. So you really need to interpret this in the clinical context. And then along with that, fixing abnormal values does not always correlate with cessation of bleeding. So um, just like everything else, this is just a test. It's very, it can be time consuming and resource intensive. It's not cheap. Um, and we don't have good data for like viscoelastic testing based algorithms. People are starting to publish this more and more. And so I think we're seeing more of that data. And so at this point, uh, I'm going to turn it over and we're going to talk about tag in special populations. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Rogers. Awesome. Thank you for having me. So once again, my name is uh, Brad, uh, Dr. Rogers, um, and I'm gonna be going over the trauma section for this talk. So the main things that I want to get, a uh, get across during uh, my section, we're gonna talk about the common coagulopathies or more coagulopathies that will kind of make your eyes wanna pop out or that you really want to pay attention to should they come up, things they tend to get discussed um, regularly. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about TEG versus using conventional assays. And then I also want to take some time to talk about the key differences between like using a TEG 5000 versus using a TEG 6S and some pearls for interpretation. So here what you have in front of you when you have trauma, there's a wide variety of coagulopathies can, that can occur, things that can tend you towards the hypocoagulability side and things that can put you towards the hypercoagulability side. So during resuscitation within the trauma bay, we're more focused on that hypocoag side because we know that patient is going to be going for surgery, they're placing chest tubes, and they may need to be doing damage control. So some of the main ones that tend to be talked about a lot um, end up being hyperfibrinolysis and um, platelet dysfunction. Okay, go ahead, next slide. Perfect. So the tech that you have in front of you in, is an example of hyperfibrinolysis. Um, within this, basically what's happening is you have an enzyme that, or basically in your body, you naturally have TPA and you have another enzyme, TPAI, that keeps that TPA in check. So when a patient gets critically injured, that TPAI goes away. So just like if you had a, um, a clot in your head and you had a stroke alert and you gave that patient TPA, that's essentially what's happening in these severely critically injured patients. So that's why you see the TEG basically blossom out, and then all of a sudden you see it come back down a flat line like that. Um, having a tech like this um, uh, usually will correlate to mortality. This particular pattern carries a 90% mortality. Um, luckily, um, now more institutions are instituting pre-hospital TSA. So I would even go as far as to say that by them doing that, you're prophylaxing against this particular pattern. Okay, go ahead, next one. All right. So at our facility, a lot of times we've actually began to use um, tag platelet mappings. And what this has allowed us to do is begin to uh, describe what the underlying function of the platelets may be. Uh, we would have a lot of patients where they may have normal tags, but then we run a platelet mapping and then we begin to see dysfunction. 
by running this, you can see um, activity on um, their AA pathway, ADP pathway. This can be affected by antiplatelets or also something that we may talk about like uh, platelet exhaustion, where the patient basically has additional platelets in circulation, but however, it's um, exceeded the capacity that you can even activate those platelets. So then you kind of have a bunch of like useless platelets circulating around that don't really uh, contribute or help the patient hemostatically. Next slide. So here we had a patient where this was a motorcycle accident from years back where um, we were doing TEG guided resuscitation using only, um, only a basic TEG. And um, throughout the night, we would check the TEG and it was um, basically normal, but the patient kept oozing from their lines, from their chest tube sites, and just overall, they were just deteriorating continuously throughout the night. By the end of it, we decided, you know what, we should run a TEG platelet mapping, which gave us more insight into what was happening with our patient. Next slide. So what we ended up finding was that even though the main tech, the normal tech that we're used to seeing all the time was basically fine, we had a situation where the patient um, ultimately had no function on their AA or ADP, and that's why they were oozing and bleeding and, thing, and things like that. And unfortunately, shortly after this tech resulted, the patient had passed away. So at times what we tend to do, or the one of the main useful things with TEG that what it allows us to do is really be more targeted with our approach to the patient's coagulopathies and those things. Because um, like in the introduction, what you saw was that some facilities would use conventional assays like INR, PTTT, and platelet count and those things, where um, if you, you're using um, VHAs, you um, are basically able to be more targeted. Good, next slide. So um, the one study that we we're looking at or that uh, I was looking through, it was a randomized controlled trial where basically they the facility was alternating between TEG and conventional assays um, weekly for, you know, basically roughly like three years. Um, and they're trying to see that if they were using TEG guided parameters and TEG guided things versus CCAs, if there could be a, um, some kind of improvement in outcomes. Go ahead, next. So um, at the end of the day, within the study, they had far, much, um, uh, far better survival within the tech, um, but within the tech group. Um, but one of the other things that also will stick out is that the patients end up using and ended up um, needing to use less blood products within, within that thing. And a lot of times with a lot of other disease states, what you'll end up finding is that if you can be, have good blood product stewardship, the outcomes generally tend to be better. Okay. So within our facility, we actually um, have made the change from using TEG 5000 to transitioning over to um, TEG 6S. And it's been far less of a, it's definitely been far less of a headache since we made that change. Next slide. So with Tech Success, one of the things that's been great with it is um, it's actually much easier and far more simple to deploy as point of care because the way that system is, it's less sensitive to vibrations. Uh, sometimes you would send a sample up and if someone had their phone on next to it and was playing music, then you would actually see the vibrations and those things in the, in the tracings. Um, and then within this one, it also had specific um, cartridges that are um, kind of des basically designated per specialty between the trauma, cardiac, or the platelet mappings. Next. Okay. And then within here, within this study, they basically were working a correlation between tech success and the 5,000. And, um, and you are able to kind of interchange your protocols but it is still important to work with your pathologist um, just to kind of run a correlation between some samples first, because population differences locally may be, there may be some characteristics that can throw off results. Okay. All right. 
So when we were on the tech um, 5000 system, one of the errors that sometimes that we often came across um, had to do with the alpha angle. So normally when the alpha angle is drawn, you would draw it from the split point up through the MA, which is that green line that you see in front of you. Um, sometimes, and this actually almost led to us inappropriately using more cryo than we wanted to, um, instead of drawing it from there, go ahead and enter, they ended up drawing it from way out from the tip. So then what happened was that was actually dropping the angles. So um, as a result, at our facility, we basically got in the habit of looking at every tracing that came through. Okay, next. So as far as interpretation is concerned, the main things that we think about when we're going through with the tag is like one, um, assessing the, each clot from, in order of uh, clot formation and destruction. So starting from the R that comes first down to the angle or CFF, depending on what facility you're at, then through your MA and then through your LI30. And then the second thing is if you still have unexplained bleeding, we would then um, make sure that we're checking the platelet mapping to ensure that there's no platelet dysfunction. Okay, thanks. So this is an example of the algorithm that we actually use at our, fa our facility. And basically we had to color code it and put it in a way where um, people could read it. Um, all the pharmacists and physicians basically have a copy of this badge buddy. So we would have an easier time with those who may be less experienced being able to read the tags and at least be able to identify that, hey, there's a major problem here. Okay, go ahead and move forward. So super briefly, so this was a case that we had where we had a 25 year old male um, down next to a scooter who appeared intoxicated. Um, during this valuation, he began vomiting and was intubated for airway protection. A stat head CT was ordered, which revealed a subdural hematoma. So neurosurgery had requested pharmacy to order a TEG um, trauma cartridge and platelet mapping and to identify um, if there is a coagulopathy with the patient. Okay, next slide. All right, so based on the TEG values, what interventions may be considered? Feel free to toss it in the chat. So you have an R of 6.6, .6, an MA of 62.8, a CFF of 19.3, in an LY30 of zero. All right, the correct answer is nothing. Go ahead and check your playlist mapping. So this patient, everything is basically in um, normal parameters. Now for your playlist mapping, based on these values, what interventions may be concerned. So you have a plain MA of 63, you have an ADP of 19.7 and an AA of 55.3. Okay, go ahead and enter. So A and A plus or minus C. All right, thank you. And now I can turn it over to George Urias. Hey everyone, so once again, my name is George Urias. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to be here. Um, when Karen reached out asking to uh, talk about VET and the chronic liver failure population, um, I was thinking back to when I initially learned about TAG back when I was in a resident in Chicago. Um, and really, I remember mostly reading about it in the surgical or the trauma population. Um, I don't remember reading about it too much in the medical subspecialties, and that's because there really isn't too much data in that um, in that area. Uh, most of the data lies in the chronic liver failure population, and so I'm super excited to share both what we know and also what we don't know. So um, I'm just going to dive right in. A chronic liver failure creates a complex hemostatic environment. It's characterized by both hyper and hypocoagulability. This ultimately leads to a rebalanced uh, hemostatic status that isn't really accurately assessed by your conventional coagulation tests because those don't capture the patient's hemostatic environment as a, a whole. 
Next slide. So fortunately, because uh, VET considers all aspects of clot formation, as uh, Karen has explained, um, it has been shown to give us a more accurate reflection of hemostatic capacity, specifically in chronic liver failure pop, uh, uh, patients. I've included two studies here. This study by Tripati um, and colleagues in 2009 showed that Rotom was able to distinguish between healthy subjects and those with cirrhosis. And similarly, in 2020, um, whom and colleagues also showed that uh, despite elevated INR levels in cirrhotic patients, um, their TEG parameters remained within normal limits. And interestingly, they also saw that uh, VET was able to provide a more accurate reflection of disease progression uh, than INR alone. So all in all, this highlights VET's um, uh, capacity to uh, capture the dynamic balance between the procoagulant factors and the anticoagulant factors in uh, liver failure patients. Next slide. So given um, viscoelastic testing's ability to assess global hemostasis, it's been proposed by a lot of us that it would be a good tool to help guide blood transfusions, particularly in um, the periprocedural setting. However, uh, before you can um, use any tests to guide clinical interventions, you first have to, have to validate it as a reliable predictor of that specific outcome. And that is where the problem lies um, in this population. Unfortunately, the evidence for uh, viscoelastic testing's ability to predict procedural bleeding remains limited. I've included these three studies, there's much more, but I think these three studies really highlight the limitations. As you can see, uh, first of all, the results are conflicting. This first study by Samani and colleagues found no association between tech parameters and procedural bleeding while the other two studies do show an association between um, the, the parameters and uh, bleeds. Additionally, there's other limitations such as um, the, the population, the patients that were excluded from these studies. Um, a lot of these studies excluded patients with concomitant infections and renal failure, which as we all probably already know, that is a majority of our liver failure population. And um, both of these um, uh, patients all have their own unique coagulopathies because of the infection or the sepsis and the renal failure as well. So since those were excluded, um, that just leaves us with tons of unanswered questions. And then more importantly, as you can see here, most of these studies actually have very low bleeding rates overall. So that really um, begs the question of whether or not coagulopathy is actually related to bleeding or if it's really just due to local complications of the procedure itself. So in conclusion, this uh, area requires further expo exploration with hopefully larger and uh, prospective trials. Next slide. So while we may not know if um, viscoelastic testing can predict bleeds, we do know that it can reduce unnecessary transfusions, both in low risk and high risk procedures. Uh, this study by DePetrie and colleagues from 2016 is cited by a lot of, of, of papers. Um, they demonstrated that VET guided transfusions resulted in a significantly lower blood product usage compared to the standard of care. And this meta analysis in 2022 also saw the same thing. And they additionally saw there was a lower incidence of transfusion related adverse events in those who received VET guided transfusions. So that's obviously something we, we all want. Next slide. So in the context of both variceal and non-variceal GI bleeds, they also saw that VET has a, a potential uh, to guide our transfusions and also reduce uh, bleeding rates. Um, this study in 1998 by Chow and colleagues saw that TEG variables, such as the R time and the alpha angle were uh, predictive of variceal bleed when you uh, are ordering um, TEGs on a daily basis uh, for about five days after banding. Um, and then more recently, uh, these trials by Rao and colleagues and Kumar and colleagues also saw that there was a lower rates of transfusion um, of transfusions and there's also a lower rates of transfusion related adverse events. So overall, these findings suggest that VET can help make more informed transfusion decisions without compromising patient safety. So given the potential benefits of viscoelastic testing in the liver failure population, 
The 2020 SECM guidelines recommend using it over your conventional coagulation tests, um, particularly in patients undergoing procedures. However, given the mixed evidence supporting VET's ability to predict bleeds, both the, or the 2020 guidelines um, state that you shouldn't use either uh, viscoelastic testing or your conventional tests to predict uh, the bleeding risk. And then the 2021 AGA guidelines actually just make no recommendation on this topic at all. Next slide. So as more literature emerges and we start using uh, um, tags and rotums more often in the MICU or in the setting, it's important to keep in mind its, its limitations, particularly as they relate to the liver failure population. Uh, it, importantly, most importantly, it underestimates the overall clotting capacity of cirrhotic patients because it doesn't capture the contribution of the endothelium, the activation of protein C, plasma levels of von Willebrand factors, et cetera. And it also does not reflect the effects of hypothermia that the patient may or may not be experiencing. So overall, the true hemostatic status of a patient may be slightly more hypercoagulable than is apparent on the, v on the tag tracing. Next slide. So in summary, uh, VET provides a more comprehensive and dynamic assessment of coagulation compared to the traditional tests. Though the evidence supporting its ability to predict procedural bleeding remains limited, um, it has proven to be valuable in reducing transfusions uh, while um, maintaining patient safety. Um, it's important to um, be cognizant of its limitations as we use it in these patients. Um, particularly because it can underestimate the true hemostatic capacity of patients with uh, chronic liver failure. Next slide. So for the patient case, this is a 58-year-old male who presents to the emergency department with hematemesis. Um, he reports weakness, dizziness, and a significant episode of vomiting earlier in the day. He has a past medical history of chronic liver failure, esophageal varices, previous episodes of GI bleed, He's got ascites, he has a history of paracentesis and hypertension and type 2 diabetes. Next slide. So the clinical scenario is the patient is scheduled for urgent endoscopy to evaluate the source of the bleeding. Um, they obtain a tag prior to the endoscopy and this is what it shows. So what would you do um, in regards to uh, transfusions? I don't see anything in the chat, but you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Yeah, so the answer is A. So again, while we don't know um, if it, a tag can uh, uh, predict bleeds, we do know that there's evidence supporting it for um, reduction of the transfusion rates and uh, adverse events related to transfusions. So therefore, uh, because the tech parameters show that the patient is not coagulopathic, um, uh, the answer would be A, that do not transfuse any blood products. And that is it. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is BB, medical ICU pharmacist at Adventil Orlando. I'll be focused on anticoagulation and antiplatelet reversal and what the utility of TEG is in these respective uh, patient conditions. The first part of my presentation deals with the anticoagulation portion and the second will be antiplatelet. And then we'll kind of summarize everything, look at what guidelines recommend and some takeaway nuances as far as what you can actually take to bedside tomorrow. I got probably less than 10 minutes with you all, so let's get started. All right, TAG has been of interest, particularly with the neuroanticoagulations such as the DOAX. Um, there has been no correlation with TAG against vitamin K antagonists such as warfarin. So INRs remains the standard of care as far as like detectability of warfarin's effect in a patient's blood. Uh, so newer studies are looking at TEG to see if there's any correlation in any of the TEG parameters when it comes to some of the newer DOACs. So one of the first studies on the first column here, or sorry, first row is Artang and colleagues. And this was tested in a nine healthy subject, so not a pathophysiologic patient who came in bleeding, but just a healthy subject 
who got a dose of dabigatran, pexaban, or rivaroxaban, and they wanted to look at different tag parameters, such as the R time, alpha angle, K time, MA, and see if any of these parameters correlated with the actual drug concentration in the body. And the one correlation that they found was with reaction time, the R time. That had the highest, strongest correlation with the R value of 0.94. And none of the other parameters, such as the alpha angle, K, K, uh, K and the MA, were affected with the anticoagulant in the body. So this is one of the first one tested in healthy subjects. So this became of interest. Therefore, subsequent studies will kind of highlight similar uh, testing methods. So Myers and colleagues in the second row, these, these investigators looked at patients prospectively, 100 patients who were on rivaroxaban, and uh, these were trauma patients who came to the hospital. And they wanted to look to see if looking at tag parameter correlated with the river rocks of an, uh, as a relative levels in the blood. And again, similar to the first study, they found a correlation with the R time with the tag. And they kind of tested the old version of tag. And then they also tested tag 6S. They test tested APTT, uh, thrombin time. And one of the biggest, strongest predictor uh, of uh, river roxaban concentration in the blood was with the tag 6S, which is the newer iteration and the R time. So the second correlation there. And then third study is Zapisky and colleagues. And these investigators looked at TEG to see what happened to the TEG parameter in patients who came in with a DOAC induced ICH and whether reversing it with PCC prothrombin concentrate, how did that affect your TEG parameter? So they tested 10 patients prospectively and they looked at pre-reversal tag parameters, and then looked at tag parameters at 30 minute, 12 hour, 20, 24 hours. And they found that the reaction time, which we saw that associates with the DOAC concentration had decreased after PCC administration. However, at 12 hour and 24 hour post, the R time went back up to pre-baseline, uh, pre-reversal uh, levels. Uh, th this could be due to the uh, duration of act action of PCC may only last six to eight hours, depending on the patient. So was the reversal only for that duration, then you had back to the reaction time because the pixaban, rivaroxaban may still be in your system, or is it just because of a different reason of their coagulation cascade in that particular patient, because it was only 10 patients. So how should we use TEG for uh, anticoagulation reversal? As of right now, it is unclear, just like what uh, George uh, mentioned in liver patients, we can use it as a second um, testing method to detect for anticoagulants such as DOAX. And I'll kind of get into what the guidelines recommend. Uh, but as far as like repeating TEGs to look to see if you have a uh, complete reversal of the anticoagulation and whether you should give more uh, Kcentra to reverse these patients, that's completely unclear. And of course, just like anything else in medicine, you treat your patient, not a single number. So I would probably recommend uh, using this in adj adjunct with other data and the patient's overall clinical picture. As far as antiplatelets and TEG goes, the data is not as clear. So I'll highlight two studies for you guys just to get an idea of what parameters to look at. I know Bradley kind of touched on the trauma population as far as like what they use for platelet transfusion and or DDAVP administration in these patients. So he and colleagues in 2021 did a 142 observational cohort in patients who came in with spontaneous ICH who were not on any anticoagulation or antiplatelets. So to highlight again, these patients were not on any antithrombotics and they were enrolled to see if there was any association in TEG platelet mapping parameter and outcome. And what they found was the AA and ADP uh, inhibition strongly correlated with more hematoma expansion, worse uh, clinical outcome down the road. So this was something of interest um, that the author highlighted. Next slide. 
And then in 2022 in neurocritical care, uh, these investigators looked to see if they can use TEG with platelet mapping in patients who came in with antiplatelet induced TB or TBI in patients who had antiplatelet on board to see if they can create a protocol. So their objective is, um, if you guys think about this, generally in non-TBI ICH, sec secondary to antiplatelet uh, therapy, generally giving platelet transfusion is not recommended uh, unless you have a neurosurgical intervention. So, because the outcomes are worse. However, in trauma population, whether to give platelets in patients who come in with a head bleed and they're on antiplatelet therapy is controversial. So uh, we, we're not a trauma center, so I don't deal with these patients, but this is just my ob observation of talking to a few people who deal with these patients and reading the literature. But these authors look, sought to look at a pre-post study where they implemented a protocol where they use TEG with platelet mapping to give more DDAVP if there's significant inhibition, inhibition of the platelet aggregation. And then th that way they wanted to test to see if they'll reduce platelet trans uh, transfusion. So this was their protocol, similar to what Bradley showed. He, he presented in millimeters, they used uh, inhibition percentage. So if you look at the first row, if you have AA or ADP inhibition less than 50 or 60%, that essentially tells you that AA tells you that there's not a lot of aspirin on board inhibiting the platelet aggregation. And then ADP tells you that there's not a lot of PTY12, such as Plavix or uh, Ticagrelor inhibiting the platelets. So there's no intervention to be done because the platelets should be functioning well. And then the second row, if they have increased in AA or ADP inhibition, then, and the patient are not going for any neurosurgical intervention, then you just get DDAVP at 0.3 mics per kilo. And then finally, the third row, their protocol was if they went for neurosurgical intervention, they gave DDAVP and unit of platelet. And with this intervention, they found that in the historic cohort, about 57% of the patients had platelet transfusion. And in the post implementation of this protocol, 10% of the patients had platelet transfusion, so significantly less platelet transfusion. And then as you can see in the second bullet point, sorry, a second bullet point, a lot more patients got DDAVP as mandated by the protocol. However, they didn't see any hematoma expansion. And also the mortality was more, it, it was, it was numeric, percentage wise, it was 18% versus 31%, 31% being in the intervention group. So um, we probably need more data before implementing protocol like this because we don't know what happens in clinical outcome. Of course, they showed that there's reduction in platelet transfusion. However, how does that translate to what happens to the patient clinically? We don't know that yet. The 2020 ACC guidelines on anticoagulation reversal, this is what they recommend. If you suspect a patient who has the bigger tran then you kind of want to check if you have thrombin time in your institution, which we don't, uh, then that is probably the best marker you can check. And if that's uh, normal, then you can exclude significant levels of the crayon. You don't have to worry about reversing it. Another alternative is APTT. And as far as like the, the factor 10A inhibitors, like apixaban, doxaban, rivaroxaban, they recommend using anti-10A activity. And their recommendation for TAG for the utility of anticoagulation does not, they don't really make a recommendation. They say we need newer data to highlight what we need. But in clinical practice, I think it's fair to check the, the anti 10 a levels, also get your tags for our time, and then assess the patient clinically, which way the patient's going. You'll of course repeat your CT scans to look at hematoma expansion and whether to repeat doses, dosing of uh, reversal agent. I mean, that's gonna have to be a multidisciplinary uh, conversation. Of course, you weigh the bleeding risk versus the clotting risk. What was the indication for the anticoagulation to begin with? So that I think is nuanced. All right. Got a patient case for you. 57 year old guy comes in uh, with a history of AFib on apixaban, uh, has type two diabetes, hypertension, comes into the ED with complaints of coffee ground emesis and black, black, black tar yeast stool. In the ED, the patient was found to be tachycardic, hypotensive, tachypnic, and profusely started vomiting blood. 
So the ED team uh, initiated RSI, emergently intubated the patient for airway protection, and the patient uh, was transferred to the ICU for further workup and management of what's going on. Uh, pertinent labs here, hemoglobin five grams per deciliter with crit of 18%, head CT negative. And then you have tech values here um, that shows an elevation of R time, maybe indicating uh, a pexaban level. So when you're assessing these patients, of course, look at your ABCs, which way the patient's gone. You want to get a thorough history with the family member on when the last dose of the DOAC was. Do they take any other concomitant antithrombotic on top of Pixaban? Were they taking a new medication that interacted with the Pixaban? Um, look at the renal function, although Pixaban is not as renally affected as maybe dabigatran. And uh, here, would we recommend reversing the patient if we confirm that the Pixaban dose is recent? Absolutely. This is a massive hemorrhage with hemorrhagic shock and you get your GI service involved and ICU team will try to revert, will give them uh, PCC and um, of course, hemodynamic support. All right. Thank you guys. All right, I'm gonna uh, wrap us up. I know we have the last few minutes. We got excited and um, put a lot of slides together, but um, you know, I think as you guys are thinking of implementing this or protocolizing this, you know, there are some things to sort of take back with you to your own institution. First of all, are you using it? Maybe you don't know. Maybe it's not showing up on your EMRs, but you have a machine in the OR, in the ER, trauma bay, in the ICUs. Maybe you have access to it. Um, it's just not something that's interfacing that maybe you know about. And maybe there's a paper protocol that some of these surgery residents are carrying around that you need to be aware of. What um, which, what are you using? So is it TEG or Rotom? And then even the specific device. So, you know, I was actually a little surprised to learn in switching from the TEG 5000 to TEG 6S at our institution, we ended up changing our whole protocol because of that functional fibrinogen. We have so much more data to act on. So it is kind of important to know all of those nuanced details. Where can you run it? For us, depending on where it's run, is it gonna be a trauma tag cartridge? Is it gonna be um, CT surgery? There are actually different cartridges that give you different data. So who's allowed to use it and uh, where exactly is it run and what data are you getting it? Is it 24 seven? Is it just during the week? When is your lab allowing it? Or is there like an approval for what service can use it or what location? Um, again, find those algorithms. They, not, they might not be in Cerner or Epic, but uh, I promise you sometimes the residents have their own little pocket cards uh, that they're using and implementing. And then do the treatment algorithm algorithms and corporate medications. And the ones we typically think about with TEG and Rotom are PCC, DDAVP, and TXA. Those are gonna be your most commonly used medications. And then of course, blood products. So we are right at the end. I'm gonna skip the summary and I'm gonna pause on the assessment questions and just ask my speakers to um, just come back on the screen. I'm gonna try very hard not to take us too far over, but I did wanna open it up and just see if anybody has any questions that we can help answer or cases or um, seen this used at your institutions. And as people are thinking of their questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat. I can start us off. And um, I guess my question to some of the panelists, particularly on the, spe the special patient populations, have you seen like a misuse or misinterpretation of TAG? And what would you say is like the most common thing that you see that's like, ah, don't use it that way. Or like, you know, I, I wish we almost hadn't gotten it because um, we're misinterpreting it. There you go. I guess I could kind of start. Um, so at our facility, one of the things that usually comes up is, did we really need to do that? So I think a lot, a lot about like the patients with the subdurals where they've gotten their repeat CT, head CT, and there's no hematoma expansion, but then um, they go, oh, wait, we never ordered a tag to begin with. So then they order it like after everything. So you have a patient clinically, nothing's really changed, but then now you have this tag and then you see this, you know, maybe the AA is like 40 or 30 and it's like baseline, but the patient's been fine, no hematoma expansion. So I, I would say like, that's one example. That's a, one thing that kind of happens over here a lot. Yeah, I 
we had uh we had sometimes like tags added to the routine cbc's q8 and then the lab comes in deranged but the patient is completely fine then you feel compelled to do something about that number that's low to give a patient some type of product so i've definitely seen fellows order products just because the lab number is low but the patient is completely fine and I, that that is the part where you have to fully look at the patient you know look at the risk benefit but definitely seen that we're also over here in the micu i'm sure everyone has encountered the the typical um patient with liver failure comes in gi bleed um and then you know elevate Elevated INR. Everyone with the liver failure with liver failure has elevated INR, and then they get their vitamin K. And um, so, ever since I started working here at UF uh, uh, Health Shands, um, I've been trying to educate the staff that you know the INR uh, doesn't mean that you're gonna bleed. First of all, second of all, it doesn't really mean um, doesn't really capture the whole picture. Uh, so uh, we've been starting to use TAG more often and and, and decrease the, the use of blood products um, in our ICU. Yeah, and I think I will echo that. I think that for me, the most um, common issue is just using it when the patient is not clinically bleeding. So if we didn't have a TAG, we almost wouldn't have done anything. Then we order it. We see these abnormalities. FYI, like a certain percentage of patients are just going to have abnormalities, healthy patients that's been documented. So you really just like any test should not order it if you don't need to act on it. Um, I did promise that I was going to try to stick us on time. I see so many questions. Um, I don't want to cut us off, but I do want to be cognizant that there is a hurricane and some bad weather. And so I have all of our email addresses here. I really encourage the audience to reach out to us. We would love to answer questions offline. And um, thank you guys so much for joining. And thank you so much for the awesome speakers for the presentation. Appreciate you guys. And everybody stay safe.